Well, good evening, friends, on this Monday evening edition of the uh, special services meetings of the Bethel Baptist Fellowship. If you're new to us, if you didn't join us yesterday for the Sunday service, we want to say thank you for being with us tonight uh, for this um, first weekday night. Uh, for the church family. You may not be a member of Bethel Baptist, and if you live in the area there in Brooklyn, I would encourage you to strongly consider coming and get to know the pastor and the people there whenever we're able to, once again, get back into interacting with other people. Right now, of course, we're all at a stage in which we're having to uh, keep our distance, so therefore we have an online service. So again, I thank you for coming and joining with us tonight for this Monday night service. I want it to be a blessing. I want it to be an encouragement. I want it to be a, a shot in the arm spiritually for the church family as a whole. And so uh, once again, as I said yesterday, I repeat again tonight, take your Bible. Follow along in the Word of God. Don't allow these moments to be just a time where you sit back and you're an observer. You know, the church of God is to be an army not an audience. So while you sit listening to the Word of God, let's listen for the purpose of life change. Can you do that? Would you plan on that? I pray that you have already asked the Lord to, have, to speak to your heart and to create that progressive life change. We looked at that yesterday morning in the Sunday morning service in the testimony of Paul. Tonight, I want you to go to the Apostle Peter's writings, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. In his first letter uh, to his friends, he was writing to them because they were troubled. They were scattered. They couldn't fellowship with one another like they normally did. Uh, when they did gather, they gathered in small groups uh, because of the government um, persecuting them. They weren't dealing with a coronavirus. They weren't dealing with um, this curve that we're longing for to see it squashed and somehow or another get our world back to normal. No, they were dealing with the persecution that the Roman government was causing among God's people. I won't get into all the reasons behind it. I just understand this. The Caesar at that time was Nero. Nero was certainly a, a, a crazy Caesar. He was a guy that uh, was extremely hateful and fervent in his animosity toward believers of the way, Jesus Christ. He was opposed to churches gathering, and so he went after them. And there was heavy, heavy persecution that was going on. Well, Peter wrote these brethren, these friends, and he was expressing to them his, his concern that they would just stay faithful during that season of time in which they found themselves in. They were underground. They were, uh, they were meeting secretly in order to uh, uh, keep from getting in trouble, again, in small gatherings of groups. And most of the time, they would only hear Peter's letter written to them as it would be read to them in some particular setting. Tonight, or yes, tonight on this Monday evening, I want to, uh, I want to read to you from chapter 5 in this first epistle that he wrote. Uh, follow this. At the very beginning of chapter 5, Peter addresses the uh, what he called the elders, which would be the pastor leaders of the church, the shepherds of the flock, and he just reminds them, keep feeding the flock of God. Uh, be faithful to lead them in scriptural principles. And he, and he was saying, don't lord over them like you're some high and mighty person. You need to be thankful for Pastor Bickle. I am for the gentle spirit with which he leads his flock and has done so for many years there at uh, Bethel Baptist. But in Peter's writings, he was saying to them, be, uh, be a gentle, loving, leading, feeding pastor. Then he addresses the whole flock. And he says this in 1 Peter 5, and notice what he says in verse 5. He says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. I, I wish I could stop on every phrase, but we're going to move on to one particular verse. Then he said, And be clothed with humility. 
Put on the clothing of humility. You know, that's one size fits all. Every one of us needs to remember that to be a humble person doesn't mean to walk around like, I'm not of any importance and I, I, I'm just no good and please feel sorry for me because I, I, could, I could never do the things that other people do. No, humility is not beating yourself up. That's a form of pride, honestly, because you're longing for attention. Humility is when you literally don't think about yourself at all. You're, you're concerned about meeting the needs of other people. Jesus was a humble servant. Peter says, put on the clothing of humility. Go on to read with me. He says, for God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, the word exalt you in due time is the idea of he's going to lift you back up to a position of being able to accomplish more for him and to, uh, uh, he's, he's not going to exalt you in the eyes of others like you're somebody special. The idea there is that there has been a stumbling time in your life. So he says, I'm, I'm, I'm saying you keep yourself under the mighty hand of God. He'll take care of you. Now, verse seven, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast uh, in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brothers and your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect establish, strengthen, and settle you. To whom be to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Several years ago, I was off preaching at a teen camp uh, in California. I was about 2,000 miles away from my wife at the time. And uh, she had some projects she was going to work on there in our house. And she... Uh, she was leaving the house to go purchase some paint to paint the, uh, some rooms in the house and to, to work on other projects there. Well, anyway, as she was backing out of our driveway, she began to hear a terrible sound coming from our car, and it was a sound of a screeching and squawking and scratching sound. She just simply pulled right back up in the garage and called me, again, 2,000 miles away, and said, something's wrong with the car. What can I do? Well, I asked her what the sounds were and what it sounded like. I'm not a mechanic by any stretch. But as she explained it to me, I thought, okay, she needs new brake pads on the car. And so I said, you know, you're going to be fine. The brakes will, will take care of you. You're, you're, they just make a lot of noise when the brake pads are going bad. Go ahead and drive the car to a local mechanic and He'll replace the brake pads and you'll be good in good shape. Well, my, my wife was uh, fearful to get back out in the car, and I don't blame her. I, as she talked to me about it, I thought, well, I don't want her to break down somewhere. Again, I'm so far away. So I called a son of mine that was working in the area, and I, I thought he never answers his cell phone but uh, when he's at work. But I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot and see if he's got any ideas because I don't know what to do. So I told my wife, I said, let me get off the phone. I'll call you back in a few minutes. I called my son. I said, hey, kid. I said, uh, I know you're bit. He answered the phone, which was a shock. He answered the phone. I said, hey, man, what are you doing? He said, I, I'm about to go on a break. And I said, well, good. I said, I, said I, I don't know if you can help me. I said, I know you're busy at work, but maybe you've got an idea. And I told him about his, his mother needing to get out and the car was not safe. And I said, I think it just needs new brake pads. And he said, Dad, I'll take care of it. I said, you'll do what? He said, I'll take care of it. I said, no, you don't understand. Mom needs to go today and start picking up paint. And I said, you're at work. And he said, Mom. He said Dad, I'll take care of it. He said, I'll, I'm on break. He said, I'll drive my car over to the house, give Mom my car. I'll drive her car back here to the shop. He said, I got two mechanics that work for us here in our shop. And he said, at lunch today, he said, we'll take it apart, find out exactly what it needs. 
I'll go buy the parts. And that's when I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to buy the parts? He said, yeah. I said, who is this? What have you done with my son? And he said, no. He goes, I'll buy the parts. And he said, uh, and, and I paid for it later. But anyway, he went and he said, I'll take care of it. And I said, but, but son, and again, the husband in me wanting to help be a part of the solution, I said, yeah, well, okay, what can I do to help? And I'll never forget what he said. He just simply said, hang up the phone. That's all I need you to do is just get off the phone. He said, Dad, I can't take care of Mom while I'm sitting here talking to you on the phone. I'm going to call Mom and tell her I'm on the way. I'll get her car. I'll take care of it. He said, Dad, you go do what you always do. Go preach. Go study. Do what you got to do. He said, I'll take care of it. You still have your Bibles open to 1 Peter 5? Would you look at verse 7 with me once again? Look at it. What does it say? Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. I know it's such a familiar verse that honestly you, you probably glibly listened to me read it a moment ago and you don't think much about it, but I'm going to tell you something. Peter was writing to people who were hurting, and I'm going to tell you, you may not be hurting this morning. Tonight, I should say. You may, not be, uh, you may not be struggling with any particular burden. But I'm going to tell you, you know this. Every one of God's people are either, uh, uh, they've, they've just come out of a stormy trial in their life. Or they're in the midst of a stormy trial. Or they're about to enter into a difficult time of testing in their life. I don't know where you are at what stage of life. The fact is you may be you may be asking yourself the, some very pertinent questions about the future because of the uh, quarantine situation that we all find ourselves in. The stay in house situation that we're in. Not even able to come to church and fellowship with God's people as we find ourselves in. When Peter was writing to his friends as bro the brothers and sisters in Christ, he said, "Let me tell you something." I'm telling you, in the midst of what we're all going through, cast all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Um, it was two years ago, at the beginning of 2018, a little over two years ago, just a little bit, when I sat in a doctor's office, and after having several tests and MRIs and a biopsy taken on my body because of pain I was suffering with, the doctor looked at me and he said, you have multiple myeloma. I had no idea what that was. I had to ask him, is that cancer? He's, he nodded his head, yes, it is. Come to find out it's the number two cancer of the globe. It's a growing Concern of something that attacks the bone marrow, the blood plasma within a person's body. And I had a case of it. In my sense of trying to solve it in a hurry, I just said, well, can we take care of it and get rid of it and have surgery? Or what are we going to do? Let's get rid of it. Because I was thinking, I got to get back on the road and travel and ministry. And he said, it's going to take several months for us to deal with this, with chemotherapy, radiation, and such like. You talk about bringing my world to a screeching halt. It was something I didn't expect to ever hear. I don't know what your situation could be. It could be cancer. It could be financial burden. It could be a relationship issue. It could be a marriage concern. It could be a, a child that's away from God that's breaking your heart. You know what the Bible is reminding us of here? Now, folks, this is not preacher talk. This is straight from the screech, right, right from the scriptures. It says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Can I lay two or three things very quickly to your understanding tonight? If you take notes, it might be a help. The first thing I see is what I'm going to call an inevitable reality. It's inevitable. It's reality. You say, what is? Well, look at the verse again. What does he say? Casting all your care 
upon him. He doesn't say in his letter, some of you who are reading this letter and some of you who are hearing it, you may go through some cares. No, he was talking to all of us included in that day and all inclusive in our day that are followers of Christ. He was saying, hear me, you're going to have cares. Well, it's inevitable. It's, it's obvious. And, and what's a care to me may not be a care to you. And what is a burden and an issue of anxiety in your life may not be that big of a deal for me or even somebody that you live with. By the way, the word care here is the, is the idea of anxiety, anxiousness, fretfulness, and worry. Friends, let me just, let's just be honest. It is not hard to find something to worry about these days. You say, oh, I never worry about nothing. Okay, I hope you don't, but I beg to uh, argue with you a little bit. I don't think that's true. I think in everybody's life, there is an innate fearfulness and fretfulness and anxiousness that creeps into all of our lives at different times of our life. Sometimes our fears and our anxieties, our cares have to do with the, the past. Something that we did in the past. We, we, somebody lives with this reminder, this remembrance of, 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 that, uh, of that association, that, uh, that those cr crowd of people you used to hang out with. And someone says, oh, if only I hadn't taken that first drink. Uh, if only I hadn't taken that, uh, that first illicit drug. If only I hadn't smoking, sm smoking. That's a new word. Uh, if I only I had not smoked that first uh, uh, joint. If, if only I hadn't gone to that website and looked at that thing online. If only I had not gone into the military. If only I had have gone into the military. If I had never gone to hang out with that crowd. And you can spend the rest of your life dragging around the guilt of the past and it causes you to be a person of care. And you can't, you don't have the joy, you don't have the, the release in your soul that the Lord Jesus is wanting us to run with, with the freedom of knowing all is well between me and the Lord. Maybe it's not the past, maybe it's the present. How, how am I going to get everything done? What, what am I going, how am I going to fulfill everything i got to do today? I think about some of you who are teaching your children, and it's a whole new world for you. And you're <clears throat> homeschooling, trying to oversee their, their learning in the home. And it, it's a burden. It's a concern. You're saying, I, I can't do this. It's too overwhelming. I, I understand. It becomes a care in your life. And as a result of it, it is a present burden, a present worry. It is something that literally consumes you to where you, you, you don't get along with your spouse. You don't get along with your, your children. You, you don't get along with your siblings. You don't get along with your parents, young people. There's all kinds of cares. You're just living under the same roof and there's a sense of tension. I'm going to tell you something. This kind of care affects your marriage. It, it affects the raising of your children. It, it, it affects your own mind. And if you're not careful, it'll affect your relationship with Almighty God. Now, you don't lose your relationship, but it, it hurts your fellowship with the Lord. Why? Cares, worries. Sometimes it's the past. Sometimes it's the present. And if it's not the past or the present, it's the possibility of the future. What if? What if this, uh, this, this quarantine, this this COVID-19, what if it goes on for another three months, four months? What if the whole year, oh, all the prognosticators are saying it could go on and on and on. How are we going to make it? What if? What if uh, the government doesn't bail me out? What if this person gets elected? What if this person doesn't get elected? Oh, what? And you can, you can absolutely let the future eat you alive and cause you to be consumed with fear. Over and over and over again in scriptures, the Bible tells us, the Lord tells us, fear not, fret not, take no thought for tomorrow, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God in the peace of God, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus." What is eating you alive today? What's causing you to be fretful? 
You ever ridden on a plane and the, the uh, pilot gets on the speaker system and he says, I'm going to ask that everybody please cinch up and tighten up your seatbelt because we're about to hit some turbulence. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I always want to ring the, the little uh, 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 the bell up there above your head to ask for the flight attendant to come over there. And I want to say, hey, if the pilot knows that we're about to hit some turbulence, can he fly around it or something? Can he go above it or below it? Or, you know, I mean, go by way of Albuquerque. I'm just trying to get to Atlanta. I don't care if it takes me a day or two to get there. You know, that's what I want to do. I don't do it. They often know turbulence is coming. Well, I, I don't know when, and I don't know in what manner. I don't know how it's going to come your way. But listen, friends, turbulence is coming. It's inevitable. It's an inevitable reality to your life and in mine. And I don't know in what means, but it could come. You may be in the midst of it right now. The first thing I see in Peter's letter is the inevitable reality, but don't miss this. There is the instant response. What's that? Look at verse 7 again. Casting. Casting all your care upon him. What is the immediate response of God's people? What's it, what's it supposed to be? It's to cast it back on him. I'm as convinced as I can be that many of the problems that you and I deal with on a regular basis come as a result of God trying to remind you and me about praying and spending time with Him. It could be that you're spending a lot more time in prayer these days than normal. Why? Because you got some cares going on. How am I going to pay these bills? Is my, is my kid going to be appropriately educated? Am I going to lose my job? Uh, I, how am I going to take care of the of the house concerns before the the summertime comes along? What am I What am I going to do? I I just don't know what's going to happen to to this issue or that issue. And we can get ourselves so disturbed to where we're dragging it around in every walk of our life and in every relationship that we have. The Bible says, "Don't hang on to it." God is saying, "Cast it back on me." Are you a are you a yo-yo prayer? What does that mean? Remember the old yo-yo games, you know, where you throw the yo-yo down on that string and then and you just kind of nod you, you, with your wrist, kind of reach back to get that yo-yo to come right back up in your hands. Do you pray like that? Oh, God, please take away this burden. Oh, God, thank you, Lord. I'm giving it to you. And then you just take it right back upon yourself and you say, I'm just going to carry it with me today and I'm going to go on through life uh, with this burden. Oh, God, please, why don't you take care of it? And you carry it and you literally wear the weight of the world on your shoulders. Casting. Casting. The idea there, the word casting is the idea of urgency. Our fervency. It's like uh, it's like the it's like a ball player taking a baseball out of his glove and hurriedly throwing it across the diamond of a baseball field to a particular base to get somebody out before they get to that base. It is. I don't want to hang on to this. Get it away from me. Urgently, cast it away. Well, I could take you all through the Bible and show you people that cast their cares upon the Lord. How else did Daniel make it when he went down in the lion's den? I mean, seriously, what was, what was Hannah doing in the temple when she was praying for a, a baby boy to be born? She was begging God. She was casting it upon the Lord. And on and on, I could go through scriptures and illustrate it. Whatever it is you're carrying tonight, cast it on him. You see the inevitable reality. You're going to have cares. You say, I'm doing fine. Yeah, Morris, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm good. I'm happy for you. Just wait. Keep going to bed at night. Keep getting up. Something's coming. And you know it's true. The inevitable reality. You're going to have cares. The instant response. Cast it on him. And finally, there's the incredible reason. I hope you're still with me. This is to me the priceless jewel in this verse. Look at verse 7. Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares, He careth for you. 
The word care in that verse is in the plural, which means all of your cares. It means all of God's people who are carrying cares, who are full of anxiety. And then he says, for he careth for you. That's in the singular, which means what? Well, you could put your name there. That's what it means. He cares for you. You and everyone that's listening, you, you say, well, I, I don't deserve his care. <laughs> Welcome to the club, son. None of us do. The fact is, he is simply saying he cares for you. And the most phenomenal truth that will ever dawn on your heart is he loves me. And he cares for me where I am. And he wants me to progress in my walk with him. The incredible reason why I should cast my cares on him is he cares for me. The great truth that I want you to see tonight is that you don't, you don't determine the, an explanation. You don't demand an explanation from the Lord. Why, why am I going through this? I don't understand this. Well, you may never understand. Go ask Job. You know what Job did not have while he was going through his trial? He didn't have the book of Job. But he found himself frequently saying, uh, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Casting that care on him because you know that God cares for you. You know, it just helps to know that somebody cares. Can I take you back to that illustration of when I had cancer? Dear friends would write me, talk to me, they'd call me, they would text me, email me. But you know the people who really helped me the most? And I didn't, I didn't know this was going to happen, but it's the truth. You know who helped me the most? People who, were, people who had survived cancer. People who had already gone through cancer. People who had gone through my particular cancer. And as they would write me, I would weep because it was somebody that understood what I was thinking and going through and the fears and the anxiousness of my life. It just helps to know somebody cares. There is nothing that you go through, nothing that God has not already understood clearly and firmly. And the Lord Jesus suffered just like you and he understands and he cares. The songwriter wrote those words a long time ago. All your anxiety all your care. Bring to the mercy seat. Leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. My son told me on the phone, Dad, just go do what you do. I'll take care of Mom. I'll take care of the car. And God says to you, I got it. I got it. You go on. You keep talking to me, but don't live in fear. Many, many years ago when I was a little boy, strangely enough, one night my dad was away from the house. He was in some form of business journey. My mom and my sister and I were there at the house, and my mom thought she heard somebody breaking in the house. But it was a frightening thing for a five-year-old boy. We went running to the neighbors, called for the police. They came over to check the house out. Didn't find anybody in the house. It did appear that someone had attempted to come through the back door, possibly. And he assured the police officer said, it's okay, you can go home now. But my mother said, no, I'm going to wait for my husband to get back home. He'll, he'll arrive in a few moments. After a bit, still just really dark that night, dad showed up. We called him across the street at the neighbors, told him what was going on. Dad walked over and went through the house again and found it to be clear. And he came back and he said, let's go home. As we were walking across the street, I was grabbing dad by the pant leg. And I said, daddy, are you sure the house is clear? Are you sure that everything is fine? He said, son, it's clear. I said, did you check every closet? He said, I checked every closet. I said, did you look underneath every bed? He said, I did. I gave all kinds of areas. I said, you know those little vents in our home? It could have been a real skinny man. Did, he, did you look inside there? He said, son, my, there is nobody in the house. Let's go home. You're fine. Daddy's with you. 
We walked inside the house, and my dad said, all right, let's go to bed. And I'm thinking, go to bed? Man, I don't think we can sleep tonight. There is no way we can sleep tonight. I mean, someone was trying to break in the house a little bit ago, and I was frightened. I laid in my bed. You ever been at night in the house when it's supposed to be quiet? You ever heard your house <laughs> settle, and it snaps, and it cracks, and it makes odd sounds, and you're convinced it's the sound of somebody breaking in when you're a five-year-old boy? I'm laying in bed with my eyes wide open, bugged out, when all of a sudden... I heard someone walking down the hall, could, stood right beside my bedroom door. It was my dad. And he was looking around the house to make sure all was safe. Actually, he was trying to make a little boy be secure. He went back down to his room and a few moments passed and he came back and took another look around the house and saw there was nothing there to be fearful of. And I... Still had my eyes wide open. He went back to his room. I don't know if another 30 minutes passed when Dad came back the third time. He was carrying a baseball bat with him the third time. That's pretty cool. And I think Dad was thinking, you know, if someone's breaking in, I'll just tear into them. He was trying to assure his son, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> Can I tell you something? The next thing I knew, it was morning. Everything was fine because my dad was awake watching over us. I finally fell asleep. God says to his people, he says to you, cast your care on me. Just cast it. You're going to have care. Cast it on me because I care for you. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know if you just came out of a storm or if you're in the middle of one, or you're about to enter one. But wherever you are, would you anchor yourself to this verse? I'll close with simply saying this. During a year of fighting cancer in my own personal life, and I'm grateful to now be in remission, I had two or three or four verses in the Scripture, passages in the Bible, that I anchored myself to and clung to and this is one of them, casting all your care upon him. Would you pray with me tonight? Father, I pray for these, my friends who are listening. Would you help them to not just hear a verse that they've heard countless times, maybe even have it memorized. Would you help them to practice it? Lord, I'm convinced that many times the cares that we go through have been sent to us certainly by your divine plan, but for the purpose of teaching us how to rest in you. So please help your people to rest in you tonight. And when that trouble and that storm and that trial, that moment of anxiety comes upon them in the days to come, help them to remember the promise that you gave to us here in 1 Peter 5. We love you because you first loved us. We say all this in our Savior's beautiful name. Amen. Thank you, friends.